Well, well, isn't this just like old times? <laughs> A company that went from being an underground development team to one of the most profitable companies in the United States, and they have one series to thank for that, regardless of whether or not they want to acknowledge that fact. The first game showed the world how first person shooters and video games as a whole could uniquely present a story. The second game showed the world what a dynamic physics engine could add to an interactive experience. The series made us laugh, made us cry, it scared us, it motivated us. It was an incredibly engrossing series of shooters that the world will never forget. And the world still hasn't forgotten. As of today, Valve is not the company we once knew. They're more focused on funneling their time and resources into services, virtual reality, and brain interfacing. Yet despite making strides in all of these fields, they'll never be the company we want them to be again. And I've come to terms with that. But for those of you watching that have never played Half-Life, simply want to remind yourself of why the series is revered to this day, or want to know why Valve ignoring their roots is disheartening for fans of their work, allow me to take you on a journey through Half-Life's impact and legacy. I'll be addressing as much as possible to give you an understanding of the breadth of the series. Development, design, technology, narrative, presentation, etc. And how these elements tie together to create each experience. Let's revisit not just Black Mesa and City 17, but everywhere in between. I'm Liam Triforce, and this is Half-Life. Gabe Newell dropped out of Harvard University to work at Microsoft, later stating that he learned more there than he ever did at Harvard. During the 90s, he was convinced of two things, video games being the future of entertainment, and their solidification as an art form. The games to do this for him were Doom and Super Mario 64, respectively. He and Mike Harrington left Microsoft in 1996 to form Valve. Assembling a crack team, Valve got to work on a horror first-person shooter using the Quake engine, which was something that Sierra Online were looking for at the time. The stars aligned for them to pursue this ambitious project. The heavy modification of the engine led to the creation of Gold Source, with completely rewritten artificial intelligence systems and support for complex skeletal animation. The latter would be an asset in realizing the team's vision for their first game, a narrative-driven first-person shooter. Gabe Newell once stated in an interview, Half-Life, in many ways, was a reactionary response to the trivialization of the experience of the first-person genre. Many of us had fallen in love with video games because of the phenomenological possibilities of the field, and felt like the industry was reducing the experiences to least common denominators rather than exploring those possibilities. Our hope was that building worlds and characters would be more compelling than building shooting galleries. Outside of RPGs and action-adventure games that were releasing around the late 90s, video game storytelling felt increasingly limited. Although cutscenes, dialogue boxes, and more traditional storytelling devices had been implemented into the medium, games didn't really have anything that they could call their own. Dialogue boxes create more dynamic versions of a picture book. Sometimes this can mean interaction is key in unfolding more of the story, but sometimes this can also barely even resemble that picture book mentality. Cutscenes are what the name implies. Scenes intercut between bouts of gameplay. The medium didn't have its own quintessential method of storytelling that was unique, and couldn't be replicated in anything else. Half-Life aimed to give video games that missing element. The question now is, how did they do it? What does Half-Life bring to the table as a whole? They restarted development after E3 1997 and faced many twists and turns after that, but Half-Life finally released on November 19th, 1998, to critical acclaim. Let's take a look at Valve's debut title. Good morning, and welcome to the Black Mesa Transit System. The game's first moments immediately sent ripples throughout the minds of fans, critics, and developers alike. Half-Life fades into a lengthy tram car ride. There's little movement and little interaction to be had, and yet the game is demonstrating so much of its inner workings and its thesis is on full display. You are able to get a glimpse into the world you're about to explore. You get to see all these scripted sequences taking place simultaneously, and watch as the employees at Black Mesa go about their daily routines. All while the tram's voice lines give you context for the place you're in, and an ambient music piece plays that is dissonant yet intriguing at the same time, relaxing yet somewhat unsettling the calm before the storm, if you will. 
this was a great way to set you up for the unprecedented level of world interaction and immersion that would come into play shortly thereafter. Since you can't really leave the confines of the tram, it avoids sensory overload as you can only take in as much as you can spot and process while aboard the tram. While this may seem gimmicky and restrictive 20 years later, that's probably only because several games after Half-Life decided to create their own interpretations of the tram scene. I find it to be impressive in demonstrating technology and ideologies that just didn't exist in games before Half-Life. This is even more apparent as you step foot inside Black Mesa. NPCs give you context for what you're supposed to be doing, but you can do whatever you like as they babble on. You can investigate the different areas of the facility and familiarize yourself with the hallways of Black Mesa. This is a necessary part of the process for conditioning yourself to the game. It was important back then and it's still important today. Back then, being able to personally investigate the environment around you and converse with scientists and security guards without control ever being taken away from you? That was unheard of. It's still important because after you've found your way around the facility, acquire your HEV suit and enter the test chamber, you'll still have to find your way back up after the incident occurs. And while head crabs and hound eyes roam the halls, it's nice to have a somewhat clear vision of where you're going next. Familiarizing yourself with Black Mesa's confusing halls can prove to be useful. In addition to all this, the way you decide to interact with the world is all up to you. You can analyze the books and pictures inside Gordon Freeman's locker, or nuke a casserole in the microwave. The way you interact isn't necessarily integral to the game's narrative, it's all just reflective of how you decide to play the game. After the incident, you are free to react to people you meet however you like. This is also what makes Gordon Freeman a great vessel for the player to embody. His existence is defined as a 27-year-old theoretical physicist that graduated from MIT. That tells you how he got to Black Mesa, but it tells you nothing about his character. That is a role for you to fill out. The Resonance Cascade is an unexplainable hiccup that left me in shock as it occurred. You're teleported to an alien world, and then you're surrounded by Vortigaunts, and finally you're left in the test chamber to your own devices. From here, it's up to you how do you decide to go about escaping Black Mesa. You could help scientists and security guards escape with you, the former group will heal you and the latter will fight alongside you. They'll all react to situations appropriately, discuss the goings on at Black Mesa, giving context to certain events. I'm not so sure I want to go to the surface. What if the world finds out what we were doing down here? This line is haunting, as it brings to question the ethics of Black Mesa's experiments and foreshadows things to come. A thought that persists in my head is always the question of, what happened? A question without an answer, and to be fair, there's nothing wrong with that. And unanswered questions would become a recurring theme in the Half-Life series. A theoretical physicist should have something to theorize about, right? It's too bad Gordon won't have time to figure out these things though as he's kinda busy swinging a crowbar at aliens. In terms of practical implementation, scientists and security guards will help you open locked rooms containing useful supplies like health packs and ammunition. However, there's another option here. The game allows you to mercilessly slaughter them. Killing security guards will allow you to pick up their weapon, while killing scientists grants you nothing at all. I can admire how these choice-driven elements are focused enough to feel warranted and have purpose. While guiding these characters can be cumbersome due to their occasionally wonky pathing, it's rewarding in the end, and it connects you with the world even more. However, you could be rewarded in the moment by getting an early pistol off of the security guard's corpse. Of course, you could play it by ear and be completely ambivalent. The choices present allow you to create a character out of the blank template left by Gordon, and have different outcomes depending on the situation. These choices aren't anything monumental in the face of games like Deus Ex, for example, but they are contextualized quite well. That line the scientist spouts will make you question the ethics of what you were quietly participating in. But as the military invades the facility and attempts to kill all the witnesses, including you, the tables start to turn. Maybe that's why when the game forces you to escort characters rather than giving you a choice, while I don't particularly like fighting with their unreliable AI, from a narrative standpoint it'd make even less sense to kill them in the face of the military being the clear villain. And while we're on the subject, even some of the marines hold resentment for the people that put them up to the task of silencing the people working at Black Mesa. I didn't sign on for this shit. Monsters, sure, but civilians rewarded this operation anyway. I killed 12 dumbass scientists and not one of them fought back. This sucks. This is what makes it so difficult for me to fight against them overall. They might be my enemies, but they've been forced to carry out an unspeakable act. And in the meantime, there's three teams fighting at once. The staff at Black Mesa, the aliens, and the military. Everyone has a common enemy, but they still remain pitted against each other. Not enough games address the morality and tragedy of situations like this. It's really interesting stuff. 
and it's what makes the Black Mesa incident such a great setting for any work of fiction. I love it when people write stories about some of the scientists that could have worked at Black Mesa, or the marines that were forced to kill innocent people. There's a lot of depth to the concept that deserves to be explored. From a narrative standpoint, Half-Life tells a story that unfolds mysteriously but beautifully so, and the full scope of the tragedy is endlessly enticing. It allows the player to react and engage with the narrative in interesting ways unseen at the time, yet still respectable today. People react to what's happening at Black Mesa accordingly, and the focused decision-based gameplay allows you to gain even more insight into the incident as a whole if you really want to. And on top of that, it never takes control away from you, allowing you to experience it however you like. I love this game's take on a video game narrative, and it's no wonder to me it influenced the industry. The gameplay of Half-Life may not be as influential as the way it presents its narrative, but that's okay. Because Half-Life brings enough to the table to feel like a unique shooter, and it's still influential in its own right. This might not be immediately apparent in combat, as your weapons are relatively standard for the majority of your playthrough. You get a crowbar, a pistol, a revolver, a shotgun, some grenades, a submachine gun, or assault rifle depending on the model you're using. It takes a while for the variety to be apparent, but the decision making between using certain weapons is what makes the selection so interesting. To do this, the game eases you into its assortment of weapons remarkably well. You first find a crowbar, which is not only more effective than you might have expected, it will also be a great ammo saver throughout the game. You can kill headcrabs by hitting them with a well-timed swing, and then by following up with a flurry of swings as they're reorienting themselves. A lot of the enemies have an opening like this, because Half-Life has an interesting quirk in its AI. Enemies can only perform one action at a time. They can't run and shoot simultaneously, for example. They need to stop moving before they can attack you. While it may seem like rudimentary AI design, I believe this was to this game's benefit. When enemies aren't attacking you, there's an opening for you to take advantage of. So, while you can use the pistol or shotgun you've found to take down zombies and vortigaunts, you can also look for an opening and just wail on them, saving ammo in the process. This is also why using security guards in combat is useful. It distracts enemies with another target, thus allowing you to take them out while their guard is down. All of this also gives the crowbar purpose throughout your adventure, whereas in shooters that preceded Half-Life, like Quake, I would almost never touch melee weapons. There was never a reason to get that close, and if I was gonna do so, I'd have a shotgun at that point, which I can find an insane amount of ammo for all over the place. Even when you get a shotgun in Half-Life, ammo can grow scarce if you rely exclusively on it. This is why the crowbar became so synonymous with Half-Life. It's reliable, and it has purpose. Back to weapons, though. Yes, most of them are relatively standard stuff, and it stays that way for a while. Most weapons do have an alternative firing method when you right-click instead of left-click, though. For example, the shotgun will fire two shells at once, although the cooldown before you can shoot again will be longer, and the submachine gun has a grenade launcher. This gives you alternative strategies for dealing with enemies, the grenade launcher being fantastic for clearing out groups of enemies, while also being easy to access. And the shotgun burst is great for getting easy kills on vortigaunts and zombies. Like most great shooters, the arsenal you build will eventually give you the opportunity to strategize. The revolver comes along soon after these weapons, and it is absolutely devastating in terms of range and damage. However, it has limited ammo and refills are hard to come by. The crossbow is similarly devastating, with some enemies going down in one hit, and it has incredible range at the cost of bolt travel time. It's up to you to choose when these two weapons might be appropriate. The weapon selection gets really interesting once you enter the second half of your playthrough. Most shooters had a rocket launcher during this era, it felt like a staple. Lining up shots as people fall out of the sky and using it as a jumping tool started to become second nature for seasoned Quake players. Half-Life flipped the preconceived notion of what a rocket launcher is expected to be on its head, by doing something pretty fucking cool. The rocket launcher in Half-Life allows you to guide your rockets to wherever you're pointing on the screen. This allows you to kill enemies from virtually anywhere as long as you can master guiding rockets. The creative weaponry doesn't stop there, as the Tau Cannon is introduced shortly thereafter. This weapon is pretty damn powerful, especially if you charge it up. It also shoots through walls if you charge it up, and the charge time is proportional to the thickness of the wall it can shoot through. It shares ammo with the Gluon Gun, which is... well, just take a look at what it does. Also unusual are the snarks that you can send out towards enemies, tearing them apart. And the hive hand, which is great for attacking enemies around corners as the bugs you shoot will curve and lock onto a target. It also feels good giving alien grunts a taste of their own medicine for once. As much as I love the weapon selection in this game, it does suffer from a critical problem. The sheer number of weapons in the game renders some of them obsolete, and others remain entirely situational. For comparison, Quake had 8 weapons, with most of them sharing ammo types, therefore employing a sense of quick decision making in combat. Which weapon would be best for this enemy type? 
How much ammo will I have left, and will I need this particular ammo type soon? All through a small yet well-rounded selection of weapons. Half-Life has nearly double the amount of weapons of Quake, and the problem I often ran into was a lack of incentive for going back to certain weapons. Because the SMG and the pistol share the same ammo, going back to the Glock seems silly as the SMG fires infinitely faster and does a somewhat equivalent amount of damage. You might decide to use the Glock in order to save the ammo, but at that point you're better off using the Crowbar, which not only swings at a decent rate, but also does more damage per swing than a bullet from the Glock. So that weapon's out. The trip mines are the most situational weapons in the game, and you really have to look hard for a use for them. I don't see Half-Life as a very tactical game. You can employ tactical strategies in combat, but the pacing of the combat doesn't allow for decisions that are slow and methodical. The game is very heavy on movement, and enemies will punish you for staying in one place. For example, the military just love to throw grenades at you in an attempt to flush you out. Vortigaunts can hit you with their electricity from anywhere as long as you aren't obstructed by a wall. Alien grunts have bugs that track you down, as previously discussed. Female assassins are designed to hunt you down. I could go on. I'm not trying to say the trip mine has no use whatsoever, because that's just wrong. They're just not viable in a game like this. Hell, the C4 rendered them obsolete thanks to them serving the same function, with full control over detonation. So we can cross the trip mines off the list too. The Tau Cannon is effectively replaced by the Gluon Gun as well, as it has a steady and predictable pace for its ammo consumption in comparison while also getting the same jobs done faster. These are the most egregious examples of what I'm talking about, but you can go further than that. The Hive Hand, for example, can be convenient, but with so many other guns that allow direct confrontation, it shouldn't be your first choice when dealing with enemies. It's mainly useful as an alternative when you need to conserve ammo. The Revolver remains useful in close quarters encounters after you retrieve the crossbow, but using it cleverly as a ranged weapon doesn't feel as smart a decision after that. These last two examples aren't as big a deal to me as my problems with the weapons I mentioned earlier, but as you can probably tell, I am a much bigger fan of the less is more approach to weapons in a shooter. Introducing these powerful weapons do give the game a great sense of progression, but even in Quake I found myself going back to earlier weapons due to them being well balanced. So that's the conflict I have with the game's stance on weapon progression, and having situational weapons at all doesn't really help. Something else that's frustrating is the level design's reliance on platforming. While Half-Life's controls aren't nearly as slippery as Quake's, they still aren't finely tuned for situations like jumping across storage crates, and especially not for walking fine lines. You can negate the slipperiness by holding the Use key, as Gordon will walk slowly when you do this but that sometimes isn't an option when you need momentum or you need to jump to a platform above you. It's really finicky, and when revisiting first-person shooters from around this era, I remind myself of how glad I am FPS games eventually tightened up their controls or nixed platforming altogether. Apart from that hiccup, however, Half-Life's level design is top-notch. We've already elaborated on how the game silently conditions you to navigating the halls of Black Mesa through memorization and practical application, and this persists throughout the game. Levels often require you to perform this memorization, and this is done through puzzles that require navigation in a loop. Opening doors and finding shortcuts in order to get the full picture. This is exceptionally done in the Lambda Complex, and is challenging all the same as the toughest enemies in the game have to be taken down along the way. This is how the majority of levels in Half-Life are designed, and they always keep you thinking about potential solutions. Even bosses are dealt with in this method. In Blast Pit, while distracting the tentacles here with distant sounds caused by grenades and whatnot, you need to infiltrate the different parts of the facility in order to utilize the rocket engine. In order to deal with the gargantua blocking your way in power up, you'll need to traverse your way around the rail station and turn on the various components to the transport network. The same boss appears in Surface Tension, and this time you'll need to utilize the military's own airstrikes to clear the way for yourself and destroy the enemy. This design philosophy is implemented poorly in one instance, however. The chapter on a rail is absolutely dreadful, and I'm sure those of you that have played this game know what I'm talking about. In it, you'll need to slowly work out a path for your little train car to proceed through. Not only are these tunnels long and elaborate, but they also have obnoxious turrets placed out of view so that you can't react to them in time, and many, many moments where you need to leave your car behind and do something in order to keep your cart moving. Sometimes this means slaughtering a plethora of grenade-loving military soldiers, and sometimes it could be as simple as finding a button. This stop-and-go nature is not to this chapter's benefit. It could have been fun if it didn't take so long, but On a Rail is at least the only chapter in the game I outright hate. Overall, great levels in this game, no doubt about that. The overall setting of Half-Life also emits this eerie atmosphere, in which nothing is certain and anything could happen. The story that slowly unfolds as you acquaint yourself better with Black Mesa makes for one hell of a rich storytelling playground. The soundtrack composed by Kelly Bailey also enhances the various moods of different scenarios. 
reinforcing that disturbing atmosphere. From that first moment on the train, this is apparent, but the soundtrack can amplify the impact of the resonance cascade through a track that literally echoes in your ears. It can heighten the intensity of encounters while staying true to the setting through an electronic rock vibe. And even fit the fight with the testicle touting Gonark like a glove. It's a fantastic soundtrack, and much like the Quake soundtrack, it sounds far too high quality and distinct for the game itself. The game looks ugly as sin nowadays despite the technical strides it made in 1998, and the sound files are all bit crushed, the compression being laughable sometimes. That's why the music sticks out to me so much, it doesn't sound hindered at all. And yet unlike Quake, the music is rarely even part of the game. Most of your adventure lacks music, it's just an eerie silence accompanied by the occasional ambient sounds of the facility. And a couple of screaming scientists. STOP! That's why when music does show up, it's all the more meaningful and enhances any scenario. Great fucking decision right there. The sound design in Half-Life is overall impeccable too. It's seriously some of the best sound design I've heard in a video game. Few sounds are as iconic to me as the health and HEV recharge sounds. <laughs> or the HEV's voice lines warning you of hazardous environments, or ammunition depletion? Ammunition depleted. I thought this suit was made for radiation. Anyway, the various sounds you hear when interacting with stuff also stick out to me. The guns sound powerful and just... Mmm, <laughs> this game pleases my eardrums. I've elaborated on all of these aspects in depth. Narrative, combat, level design, atmosphere... And yet, these aspects aren't necessarily segmented. I mentioned Half-Life's gameplay not changing the world when looked at from a glance, but perhaps the most revolutionary thing about Half-Life's design is how seamlessly it blends all these elements together without you even being conscious to that fact. It silently manages its pacing this way, creating an engaging experience through little bits of each element blending together to create a game that keeps you engaged. It seems like a simple process, really, but not many games can pull off this kind of design cohesion. Half-Life balances all of these elements well, and consistently so. Apart from on a rail. Fuck that level. The climax of the game totally caught me off guard the first time I experienced it. I was enamored with the concept of Zen, but I didn't think I'd actually be able to visit it. It's a very visually interesting world, and it carries with it a unique atmosphere that harkened back to the Lovecraftian setting of the game Half-Life was built from. More importantly though, it introduces you to all kinds of new challenges. Utilizing the long jump module to clear the various platforming challenges isn't the most fun in the world as you might have already guessed, but the new enemies you get to fight in Zen make it all worth it. From the colossal head grab with a giant testicle to the giant baby in the sky, Zen proved to me that Half-Life still had a few tricks up its sleeves. It's a little rough around the edges with its relentless platforming and difficult enemy placement, but it's nothing I can't forgive in the face of creatures like the Gonark. I can't say I saw that thing coming. The giant baby known as the Nihilanth is an extremely disturbing final boss. Its overall appearance and the way it speaks are both nothing short of unsettling. Dealing with it feels more like a traditional boss battle, and aside from that one last obnoxious platforming section, it is a pretty cool showdown. Once you take down the Nihilanth, a familiar face will appear before you. Although the model name refers to the character as G-Man, he is never given a name. This mysterious man could be seen in all kinds of different places around Black Mesa, and his purpose was unbeknownst to you. Until now. His speech is slow and you can practically feel his breathing. Gordon Freeman in the flesh. Or rather, in the hazard suit, I took the liberty of relieving you of your weapons. Most of them were government property. As for the suit, I think you've earned it. His employers wish to offer you a job, as you are able to fight your way through Zen and take control back for them, whoever he might be referring to. 
The game gives you one last choice, either take the portal and await your next assignment, or stay behind and be killed by the creatures on Zen. From here, this man would take on a much more foreboding presence in the mind of any Half-Life fan. Initially seen as some weird guy that could be found in different locations around Black Mesa, some of them impractical, he is now in complete control of your destiny. And that sets the stage for infinite possibilities. Half-Life is one hell of a game. And while certain aspects of the game stick out to me as antiquated, its core design philosophy shines through and has unquestionably stood the test of time. If playing through it still feels like a big deal to me today, I imagine the impact it left in 1998 was astronomical. I wasn't able to jump on the Half-Life train until about a decade later, but it's clear to me just how much of an influence the game left on the industry. Without a doubt. Half-Life included the level design tool Worldcraft upon release, and Valve would also release a software development kit to the public as well. As you'd expect, a plethora of third-party mods would begin popping up in both single-player and multiplayer forms. In order to promote the SDK, Valve hired the creators of the Quake mod Team Fortress, and had their newly assembled team port the mod to Gold Source. The SDK also sprouted mods such as Counter-Strike, and as we all know, these two games would have a prosperous future. To go over every popular mod for Half-Life, I'd have to talk for ages. But it is an important part of Half-Life's history. A lot of developers making mods for Half-Life would eventually have a bright future in the industry. Half-Life was a playground for all kinds of new talent to let their creativity shine, and Valve would even bring some of these people on board for future games, as I just mentioned. Half-Life and Gold Source both meant a lot to these developers. Their passion for the game led them down exciting paths, yet another result of the game's impact. Early attempts to follow up on the success of Half-Life would be crafted by Gearbox Software, whom you might know of today for creating Borderlands, and for Randy Pitchford's inane rants. Anyway, Gearbox's partnership with Valve would result in the expansion known as Half-Life Opposing Force, released on November 19, 1999. Although it doesn't take very long to complete, it is an incredible burst of creativity. Despite carrying with it a few missteps that were results of Half-Life's lingering issues, it is really, really good. Opposing Force introduced Adrian Shepard, a soldier sent to infiltrate Black Mesa after the Resonance Cascade. However, what's interesting about this scenario is you're never issued the orders to silence the scientists. Your helicopter goes down before you can learn more about your mission. Scientists hint at this fact as other marines have flooded in and started killing them, but by no means do you have to do this. You can make Shepard out to be whatever kind of person you think he should be. The G-Man also directly messes with Shepard. At the end of the game, he reveals that he was in contention with his employers about Shepard's fate, but he eventually prevailed. I admit I have a fascination with those who adapt and survive against all odds. They rather remind me of myself. If for no other reason, I have argued to preserve you for a time. The G-Man places Shepard in stasis, and to this day, his next chapter remains unwritten. Shepard really is an interesting character considering the perspective. But Opposing Force isn't just interesting for its narrative. It introduces a handful of new weapons that either add to or replace items in your arsenal. The wrench and knife are your melee weapons this time, and both have practical uses. The wrench deals a decent amount of damage and you can wind up a powerful swing by right-clicking. Conversely, the knife functions similarly to the crowbar in speed and damage, but you can also backstab certain enemies for an instant kill. This is something I wasn't aware of on my initial playthrough of the game, but that's pretty fucking sweet. You also have two pistols, one of them being the standard Glock, and the other being a Desert Eagle. This powerful pistol replaces the revolver, but I'd argue that this decision was for the best considering how many other options you have for damage output. You also get a sniper rifle, replacing the crossbow, a light machine gun, and a few unique tools. The Dispatcher Cannon is essentially the BFG from Doom. It'll shoot a large ball of green light that shocks anything in its surrounding area. Speaking of which, the Shock Roach has electric bolts that deal a modest amount of damage, however its ammunition constantly regenerates. The Spore Launcher feels like a bizarro grenade launcher in practicality, and it can be my go-to for dealing with tough enemies in late game, especially considering how plentiful their ammo becomes. The last weapon isn't used for dealing damage. You use the tongue of a barnacle to grapple to designate its spots. This is pretty cool, and it's vital in fighting the expansion's final boss, which involves great problem solving and reflexes, by the way. Opposing Force really does feel like Valve could have made it all in all. It's not very long, but that's what makes it concise. And considering everything it brings to the table in such a short time span, I'll continue to revisit it as much as I do the rest of the series. It's so good. It definitely sets an example for future expansion packs.
as in, it expands the universe of the game and explores new gameplay paradigms within the boundaries of its base game and engine. Not enough to be a fully-fledged sequel, but enough to be a worthy addition to the Half-Life anthology. And I mean, above all else, you can follow Gordon into the Zen portal, only to fall to your death and be met with a splash screen warning you of your paradoxical behavior. This is the real highlight of the game here. As much as I love Opposing Force, I can't really say the same for Half-Life Blue Shift, released on June 12, 2001. Originally meant as an exclusive bonus for the Dreamcast version of Half-Life, the port was cancelled late in development as the Dreamcast was dying quickly and gracelessly. Blue Shift feels like nothing more than what it was intended to be. Some extra levels for the Dreamcast version. Barney Calhoun isn't fleshed out as an interesting vessel for the player to embody like Freeman and Shepard before him, and player choice is oddly restricted this time. There's even a scenario where your character is implied to have spoken to a character, as Dr. Rosenberg responds during a scripted event as if you gave him an answer. And guess what? A forced escort mission ensues. Yeah, it's not great. I also find it odd that NPCs don't even react to you shooting wildly around them, just because you work there. But in some scenarios, as soon as you kill them, they game end you? Hello? Speaking of restrictions, not only can you not obtain any of the weapons from Opposing Force here, but you don't even obtain every weapon or encounter every enemy featured in the original Half-Life. Nothing new at all. When you consider that this was initially a Dreamcast bonus, it might soften the disappointment a bit, but it does suck that it doesn't bring much to the table, and most of what it does bring is annoying. A port of Half-Life for the PlayStation 2 did come out on November 11, 2001, and it featured an exclusive cooperative campaign called Decay. It's a glorified Sven co-op map pack, and although it tries very hard to convey a serious narrative and tie Half-Life plot events to it, I can't take it seriously at all. It's just too funny watching your partner do leg tuck jumps around the screen while you're supposed to be paying attention. The pack itself does implement really interesting cooperative puzzle solving, and being able to watch each other's backs in tough situations add up to an expansion that I can definitely recommend. Modders have made it fully playable on PC since its release, and I'll include a link to that in the description. They even ported over the bonus chapter where you play as a Vortigaunt, which is definitely something I want to check out because I don't have the time in my life to get all A ranks in Half-Life Decay. After the PS2 port though, Half-Life news would grow silent for a bit. Valve were working on something that would take them through the shakiest development cycle in the history of the company. Half-Life 2. Following up Half-Life was not going to be an easy task. You make a game-changing shooter that revolutionized so many different aspects of game design as a whole, and now you're asked to go and do something like that again? Where do you begin? Well, very early on, Valve knew they wanted to double down on player interaction and immersion. They would focus on developing a new engine using Gold Source as a base, implementing features such as a dynamic physics engine thanks to a heavily modified version of Havoc. In addition to fidelity being increased significantly, Valve would also work on creating realistic facial animations in order to properly convey emotion, thus letting players connect with characters more naturally. The journey to figure out how they would utilize these things took them down a six-year development cycle, full of interesting twists and turns along the way. Half-Life 2 was always going to be set during the aftermath of Black Mesa, however the setting was initially much, much darker. An ominous green air is a recurring element throughout early concept art for Half-Life 2, and it was a result of the air exchange. This created the heavy brown and green aesthetic that you can clearly see in a lot of Half-Life 2's concept art. While the purpose of this element is debated, I believe leaving it ambiguous makes it even more terrifying. This created a foreboding atmosphere and further emphasized the horrific power of the Combine. The Combine were truly an oppressive force, and it seemed that citizens truly didn't have any freedom left in any aspect of their life. Enemies known as Cremators roamed the city, incinerating corpses and otherwise patrolling the streets. No, Cremators didn't come from Zen, as horrific and alien as they might look. They've been built from parts created by child workers in factories. Even if you're a citizen seeking some form of escapism, the Combine's cruelty will still manage to slip through the cracks. The Manhack Arcade would have let you take control of a Manhack in order to kill fleeing rebels, only for it to be revealed that it wasn't a simulation. Indeed, the Combine controlled the population in every way imaginable. Citizens were even being forced to wear gas masks while out in the open, in order to conserve oxygen, as this cut line of dialogue implies. The true citizen conserves valuable oxygen. What you're hearing is the predecessor to who would become Wallace Breen, known as the Consul, 
and as a lot of characters changed throughout the narrative's development, like Alex and Eli, so did gameplay elements. Several weapons were cut, and interaction with the physics engine was treated as a more integral part of the game's design. Valve really trimmed the fat when developing the game. And while I do think about what might have been with a lot of this game's early plot elements and general atmosphere, there's a reason we have the game we know today. If you'd like to learn more about these early or otherwise abandoned concepts for Half-Life 2, check out Half-Life Project Beta, a website dedicated to preserving and restoring Half-Life 2's development. A lot of these elements are in a playable state, and are available to download from their website. Definitely worth checking out if you're interested at all. After finally settling on a direction, development continued and the game would evolve into what we know as Half-Life 2 today. The game was finally shown to the public for the first time at E3 2003, and its initial showcase blew people away. It looks like hell. Wow. We've been rather busy in your absence, Mr. Freeman. Along with unfathomably realistic facial animations for the time, and advanced shading and lighting effects previously infeasible to run in real time, Valve also showed off the Source Engine's physics system for the very first time. Complex and dynamic physics systems were slowly becoming a more common occurrence in games. But Half-Life 2 was special. It gave the player full control over every aspect of the physics, and the way different objects interacted with each other was unbelievable. To think that a system like this would be put in the hands of players was baffling. Could you give the player this much control without breaking the game? How could they do it? Well, Valve demonstrated how this would positively impact the game's core design by demonstrating an early version of Ravenholm, in which your resourcefulness would play a vital role in making it out alive. For example, using any kind of household item as a weapon. The list goes on, really. This glimpse was enough to elicit an insane amount of anticipation for the game, and I love going back to this video just to reminisce over how much of a big deal it was for the people watching. I feel the same way about the Twilight Princess reveal in 2006, and the Metroid Prime 4 reveal in 2017. Seeing a bunch of like-minded people come together and just flip their shit over a surprise announcement for one of your favorite game series just feels magical. This anticipation, however, led to some unfortunate side effects. While the proposed September 2003 release window was exciting at the time, something would happen that would confirm this window was wishful thinking at best. That month, Valve's network was compromised, and along with the source code for the Source Engine, a playable version of Half-Life 2 was leaked. The game was clearly in an unfinished state, and proved to the public that there was no way in hell the September release window was going to be met, which was an embarrassment on Valve's part. On top of this, Several early maps from various stages of development were also leaked, and that's where the fascination with the beta for Half-Life 2 would initially begin. The world now had access to all kinds of assets Valve never intended for anyone to see. While the hacker was eventually arrested, this resulted, unsurprisingly, in a massive delay. Valve took another year to polish the game up and rework several components. Thankfully, anticipation for the finished game only grew as the months went by, and as the new launch date approached, only time would tell if the game really was a worthy successor to Half-Life. A book called Half-Life 2 Raising the Bar was released shortly after the launch of Half-Life 2. And along with a plethora of information about the development of the series, it also contains a pretty emotional foreword by Gabe Newell, which I think everyone should hear. As I write this, I have the world's worst case of stage fright. After six years and tens of millions of dollars, after break-ins and lawsuits, after marriages and children and divorces and deaths, we're about to ship Half-Life 2. You, the reader, know how the launch of Half-Life 2 went. You've read the reviews, seen the sales figures, heard about awards, or the lack thereof. And best of all, you've played the finished game. We've done none of these. Did we create a worthy successor to Half-Life? Did we live up to gamers' expectations? Did we pull it off? You know, and I don't. And that seems terribly unfair to me right now. Half-Life 2 finally released on November 16th, 2004. It went on to receive near-unanimous acclaim, and like its predecessor, has been hailed as one of the most influential video games of all time. It's hard for games from 15 to 20 years ago to feel completely timeless. Even the most timeless of games that play like they could have been released yesterday have something about them that remind you they're a product of their time. 
Max Payne's shooting and bullet time are so well done that the only thing that reminds you it's a game from 2001 are those ugly ass graphics. Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 3 introduced the revert and allowed you to continue your combos perpetually, but its visuals, soundtrack, and overall mood remind me of the skater mentality of the late 90s and early 2000s. That may not be a bad thing, but for people getting into the series today, it's gonna be a little jarring. Whether they be technical or design elements, there's always something that pulls me out of whatever I'm playing from that era. There are a few games that definitely transcend the era they were released in, however, and Half-Life 2 is one of those games. I've replayed it countless times over the years, and virtually nothing about it feels antiquated to me. The game's graphical capabilities may not be as impressive as they were in 2004, but they were such a huge leap forward at the time that they look about as good as some games releasing in the early 2010s. This is a testament to the Source Engine's flexibility. It stands the test of time, and it's still being utilized today in games like Titanfall and Apex Legends. Yeah, the game has quirks in its artificial intelligence, but these quirks are still a problem games face today. They haven't gone away with time. AI can be difficult to program. Programmers need to create all these unique functions to account for various scenarios, and both playtesters and average consumers can find cracks in a game discovering a scenario developers hadn't thought of before. That doesn't excuse the issue, but it hardly means it's a product of its time. But I'm getting ahead of myself. How exactly is Half-Life 2 a timeless experience? And what does it bring to the table in comparison to the first game? More importantly, why is it still heavily discussed and cited in various forums to this day? Well, let's take a look. Rise and shine, Mr. Freeman. Rise and shine. The G-Man wakes Gordon out of stasis, foreshadowing the damage and consequences of Black Mesa 20 years later. So wake up, Mr. Freeman. Wake up and smell the ashes. I think most of us know this intro by heart at this point. The G-Man proves to be a more menacing presence this time, since it feels like he's in total control. Every time I'd see him this time around, I'd always feel uneasy. Who is he? What is his real mission? Who are his employers? Yet again, questions without answers, and I'm totally fine with that. This monologue also gives you an up-close and personal look at Valve's complicated facial animations I discussed earlier. To this day, these animations will always seem more impressive to me than motion capture because of how lifelike they actually seem. That's not to say motion capture doesn't have a place in games, but because it mimics reality, it can channel this rather uncanny feeling. Games can render some really insane visuals in real time these days, and developers are taking advantage of that by making them look as close to real life as possible. This screenshot from The Last of Us 2 is kinda freaking me out actually. Valve could have taken the easy way out and mocapped their actors, but instead they created everything entirely from scratch. They even consulted with a research psychiatrist to make sure their facial expressions were entirely accurate. This technological push is probably what inspired this imitation of reality we see in games today. And to be honest, that's not a bad thing. Motion capture allows voice actors to become, well, actors. Full-fledged actors delivering convincing performances, embodying the characters that they're portraying. What's impressive about Half-Life 2 in comparison is how realistic they seem without falling into Uncanny Valley. If it was Valve's goal to enhance narrative presentation this way, they definitely met that goal. Every line the voice actors delivered are characterized and contextualized by these animations. Dr. Kleiner's finger-pointing and firm posture, Dr. Breen's conniving and dehumanizing gestures, even the zombies in Civil Protection, for example. The animations all aim to further develop these characters in a subtle way. Subtlety is probably Half-Life 2's strongest suit in storytelling, bar none. No info dumps and no overbearing presence of science fiction. Half-Life 2 integrates the Combine's presence into the everyday lives of citizens in City 17. And if you want to learn more, all you have to do is take a look around. If you pay attention to Dr. Breen's speeches, you might learn about how he negotiated with the Combine for the survival of humanity. Despite this, they continued to control the population by enlisting humans in their army and using a suppression field to prevent reproduction. It's a really sad situation, but of course, as Half-Life has established thus far, you are in control of how much you want to learn about the world around you. You can interact with citizens around the neighborhood, or you can initiate an accelerated backhop away from the CP towards the cafeteria behind you. In Dr. Kleiner's lab, you could pay attention to whatever him, Barney, and Alex are talking about, or you could learn about the Seven Hour War when the Combine took over. You could find a picture of everyone at Black Mesa, stare at the G-Man through a TV, or literally anything you can think of while they babble on about God knows what. Truthfully, the dialogue in these scenes are interesting and well-written, 
and they established some pretty great characters too. I'm glad Valve opted to create properly defined characters this time around, because a world like Half-Life definitely deserves an exploration of these characters' lives. I know it's a bit odd that they disregard the possibility of Gordon slaughtering scientists in the first game, but they do so for a reason. The Black Mesa incident affected so many people to begin with, and it's cool meeting survivors like Dr. Kleiner and Eli. Eli's daughter Alex is your companion throughout most parts of the game, and rather than spouting exposition and context for what you're supposed to be doing, she instead explains how she feels about a situation and lets you know what people were doing and why they were doing it. I mean, she'll give you that exposition, no doubt about that. But it's kept to a minimum. Personality-wise, she's feisty, but that is definitely a positive trait. She can vouch for herself and kick ass when she needs to. She's also intelligent, and along with building a giant mechanical companion named Dog, she can also analyze situations well. Sometimes too well, and she can go on for a while, but it's in her nature, I suppose. She also has reason to be skeptical of people like Judith Mossman, who actively betrays the Resistance. She claims it was to keep Eli alive, but that wasn't exactly a guarantee at the time, just as Breen's negotiation for the fate of humanity is riddled with uncertainties. A lot of these events are beyond your control, but watching the characters genuinely and properly react to them is what allowed me to connect with them. I mean, we're in a unique situation here. How we connect with these characters is an entirely subjective thing. Gordon is but a vessel, and the game's asking you how you feel about this, not him. That's what it all comes down to. If you don't give two flying fucks about anybody in this game, you don't have to pay attention to them. Unless you're in an elevator with them. But I think they all play off of each other pretty well and have generally likable dynamics, so it's easy to pay attention to them for me. Overall, I think the point of these characters is to demonstrate that they are a small piece of a much bigger resistance team. Most NPCs in Half-Life 2 have a story to tell, and piecing them together can contextualize your adventure and your end goal. If the main characters are meant to be one note, at least they have entertaining personalities. At this point, Gordon doesn't really have anyone or anything left. Your priorities are yours and yours alone. If you want to learn more about the Combine and what they've done to humanity, you can do that. Or you can spray bullets like a madman and make your way to the Citadel without a shred of concern for anyone around you. This is a philosophy that I believe was lost in future Half-Life games as they decided to focus more on the plot, but I don't even mind that much either. The point is, Half-Life 2 gives you every opportunity to care about what's happening, and you can look as deeply as you want into the circumstances of the characters. For example, here's something I concluded while thinking about the Vortigaunts. After being freed when Gordon defeated the Nihilanth, the Vorts decided to fight alongside humans and push back the Combine as best they could. What I concluded was that they learned English by listening to humans, and since people called them the Vortigaunts when referring to them, I believe that's why you hear them say the before referring to a proper noun, like the Freeman or the Alex Vance. This is stuff that you don't have to pick up on, but it's there if you're interested in the world like I am. It reminds me a lot of Metroid Prime. You don't have to scan everything around you, but it gives you context for what's going on. And that can be interesting to some people. And yet, with all this world building and lore on our hands, Half-Life 2's take on science fiction feels downplayed in comparison to the last game. But don't get me wrong, that's exactly what I love about it. It's what makes the world of Half-Life 2 feel so close to home. You have the looming presence of the Citadel, the aforementioned mysterious appearances of the G-Man, and Combine forces gradually reveal their powers to you through iterations in power for their soldiers. All progression and ideas, and yet it all feels grounded in reality. I'm driving down Highway 17 and smashing through Combine forces, but at the same time, I'm stopping to stare at the tire swings and the comfortable vibe of the abandoned homes that families might have lived in at some point. I'm not reflecting on the possible science behind the Combine's power, I'm reflecting on how the Combine might have affected people on an emotional level. This isn't an absurd feeling this is evoking either. With couples comforting each other and with corpses filling the streets, it's a very dark time for humanity. This hopeless atmosphere is what makes the parts where you're alone in an abandoned environment feel depressing, yet all the more poignant. This game's atmosphere is beautifully diverse, varying from tragic and empty to abrasive and frightening. Once again, this atmosphere is enhanced by Kelly Bailey's fantastic soundtrack. A few songs are reused from the first game, but they're warranted. The track that first played when you were entering Black Mesa now plays as you pull up in front of Eli's lab, a reminder of past events. What we now associate with Valve's theme song now plays when you put the HEV suit on. They all feel like appropriate reuses. And the new tracks are even better and more appropriate. Not many of Kelly Bailey's compositions can rival the sheer amount of atmosphere created by the track Lab Practicum, which plays when you are as far out as possible on Highway 17, crossing a ruined bridge amidst the fog.
CP violation plays as you're evading civil protection in the City 17 canals. And while it ends just as you make it out of sight, it picks up again as they start using explosive barrels on your ass. I could go on, but I'd be here all day. Half-Life 2's soundtrack is phenomenal. Same goes for the sound design once again. There's no limit to how far they can go with sound design this time. The ambience of City 17 is truly one of a kind. The sounds of scanners floating around, the Overwatch announcements, and CP radios going off all clash with the look of a city that should feel comfortable. But the sounds pull you right back into the reality of the situation. I also love the sounds all the enemies make. The combine radio chatter is hard to make out, but it is iconic. I also love hearing civil protection flatline when I kill them, just as an audio cue to keep you on your feet. The cries the zombies make in this game still creep me out. Most other games use cliched, guttural moans and growls for zombie noises. But because zombies in this game are created when a headcrab takes over the host, the noises are pained moans and it cries for help. These cries are accentuated when zombies are lit on fire. The weapons sound even better this time around. I mentioned they pleased my eardrums last time, but some of the weapons in this game brought me to proverbial climax. This is a small sampling of Half-Life 2's sound design, and you really can't get the full scope unless you play it yourself. But yeah, it's incredible. Alright, I've talked long enough about the context and circumstances of the game. How about we discuss what the game actually plays like? Well, as I mentioned earlier, Half-Life 2's claim to fame is its dynamic physics engine. A game where you play as a theoretical physicist should have something to do with physics, shouldn't it? Solving physics puzzles is a cool way to connect with that one bit of backstory that felt irrelevant before. You know, seeing as all you did on the job in Black Mesa was push a cart and press buttons. And yeah, Barney makes sure to poke fun at that. Good job, Gordon. Throwing that switch and all. I can see your MIT education really pays for itself. Perhaps the best thing about the physics engine is that it's integrated so heavily into the core design of the game that you're not even thinking about it most of the time. Just like how the first game manages pacing, which this game does just as well. When this officer knocks a can over and asks you to pick it up, the physics engine is silently doing its job. And you can experiment even more in this first part of the game, maybe by placing cement blocks on a seesaw. When you kill enemies, their limp bodies hit the ground in a satisfying manner, thanks to the engine's ragdoll physics. And as soon as you see the bodies begin to fall, you can focus on another enemy. In order to get past these barnacles here, you can distract them by rolling some barrels down for them to suckle on. Some of them being explosive. The vehicles have legitimate weight to them because of the engine and thus feel satisfying to control. When you blow up an explosive barrel, others in its vicinity will explode too, thus allowing you to cause a chain reaction. It's the little things that add up, and discovering these things are some of the many ways Half-Life 2 silently conditions you to its physics. And they test you practically with physics puzzles like this one here where you need to use barrels to lift the ramp out of the water. Since the barrels have buoyancy, they'll lift the ramp and keep it steady as you drive across with your airboat. An unusual and clever puzzle, and the game has taught you to think outside of the box up to this point so its inclusion makes sense. As you accustom yourself further to the subtle complexities of the physics, the game decides to give you full control of these objects using the gravity gun, a tool that can carry most objects and launch them at breakneck speeds. The tutorial for this weapon is actually pretty quaint, as they have you play catch with dog outside of the lab. Then the game decides to let you loose with the gravity gun in one of my favorite levels in the game. Ravenholm definitely channels that early Half-Life 2 aesthetic we discussed earlier, and because it's so visually different from anything else in the game, it's immediately appealing. The mysterious but trustworthy monk known as Father Grigori will be your guide throughout your trip, and it's probably best that you have someone by your side because this place is crawling with zombies. However, the level highly encourages that you expend as little ammo as possible, as there will be a large ambush with newer and more powerful zombies just a little down the road. So what's your alternative here? using literally anything and everything as a weapon. Crushing zombies with a car, flinging buzzsaws through rows of them, the town is your oyster. Ravenholm can be experienced in many different ways thanks to its many methods of completion, and its unusual atmosphere and self-contained plot is something to behold. Every time I leave Ravenholm and I hear Father Grigori's crazed cackling behind me, I remind myself of just how cool and unique it is in comparison to the rest of the game, and how, outside of City 17, things can be much, much worse. It both teaches and tests you on things related to the physics engine, and its atmosphere is unlike anything else in Half-Life 2. And after you exit, you don't see another Resistance member for a good while, but when you do, it's cathartic. The physics engine is always a part of Half-Life 2's design. It's a simulation. 
It seamlessly integrates itself into the game and acts how you expect it to. I'd like to sit here and list the instances where it surprised me or impressed me, but the truth is they could be endless. Whether you're manipulating it to progress through sections, solving puzzles, or using it in combat, the game wants you to utilize it as much as possible. It succeeds in both being a front and center part of gameplay, as well as silently acting in the background. I'll let project lead Jay Stelly summarize its importance. I was watching a playtest and they were just messing around, punting a tire swing back and forth trying to get it to loop over the top. They had it almost there, but not quite. So they ran forward to hit it again, but missed, and the tire ended up landing on their head, killing them. They just sat there laughing, thinking it was the greatest thing in the world. It wasn't so much that the tire had killed them, but they had just done it themselves. They had found a clever way of interacting with the world and the game had let them do it. It wasn't really so much about realism as it was about discovering how the game and the world were reacting to them in ways that they hadn't seen before, then finding out there were surprising and interesting consequences. But what else about Half-Life 2 has been improved? While the few complaints I did have with the original game have since been addressed, Escort missions are basically non-existent. Alex can hold her own most of the time, and the rebels you bring along with you don't need to survive. It's always nice to have extra help with you, and keeping the medic alive is an absolute must when you're low on health, but never are you required to babysit them and prevent their deaths. Platforming does still exist in Half-Life 2, but thanks to the tighter controls and the addition of a sprint function, you have more control over your movements. But what's best about these overall platforming sections is how you can approach them. Most of them are created out of unique situations that require ingenuity from the player, as well as general knowledge of the physics engine. In the chapter Sand Traps, you find out that the sand is crawling with antlions. In order to escape, you need to create a path for yourself by scavenging for any kind of debris and collecting it with your gravity gun, placing the different pieces in just the right way so you can make it across without having to deal with them. Of course, no one's telling you to do this. You can run across the sand and massacre antlions if you really want to, but it's moments like these that make Half-Life 2 shine and then demonstrate how you can turn something that didn't work very well the first time into something truly creative and interesting. This isn't an isolated experience either. How about limboing under lasers in a tight room? Still a platforming challenge, but under a new context with revamped controls. The only other problem I had with Half-Life was the weapon selection getting somewhat confused toward the end of the game, if you recall. In contrast, Half-Life 2 has much fewer weapons to choose from. However, I believe that this was to this game's benefit. Because there aren't as many weapons to choose from, I found a use for each and every one of them. The USP allowed me to stay back when dealing with weaker enemies. The revolver, SMG, shotgun, crossbow, grenades, and RPG are all useful for the same reasons they were in Half-Life 1, and they function identically too. There's a secondary automatic gun known as the pulse rifle, and while it lacks accuracy, it sure does pack a punch. Its secondary fire launches a pulse grenade which will bounce all over the place and disintegrate everything it touches. If you use it in a small room, you will absolutely wreck shit. Not a huge selection of weapons, right? And most of them are the same as the first game. But not only do these weapons all serve a purpose, you also have the gravity gun, which allows you to use anything as a weapon and make it through combat in creative ways. There's the trade-off. So I'm not really bothered. I know I criticized Blue Shift for having a weak selection of weapons too, but Blue Shift didn't really bring anything to the table at all, whereas Half-Life 2 did, exponentially so. Combat scenarios have also been made more interesting thanks to the gravity gun, the physics engine, a focused weapon selection, and much tighter controls. Most of the time you need to be light on your feet as the Combine will outright bum rush you. Follow Freeman is a chapter that best exemplifies this, as the Combine go all out with every enemy type imaginable. They surround you and push back with everything they've got. You need to be quick and smart with your weapons, especially when dealing with striders and choppers. The Combine is infamous for something though. They will just throw their lives away, charging at you with no concern for their well-being. Although the Marines could only perform one action at a time, it was figuring this out that would give you the advantage. Here the advantage is to have them run at you and then you can just overpower them. However, because the Combine are programmed to play so aggressively, it makes encounters with them feel more intense and less exploitable. There are scenarios where you can hide behind something and then assault them as they turn the corner, but if they have grenades then that's out of the question. This is also infeasible if they have a shotgun. I don't know why they decided to do this, but combine shotgunners can shoot faster than you can process what's happening to you. In claustrophobic levels like Nova Prospect, this can be a bitch to deal with. The combine soldiers are generally the focus when it comes to enemy variety in Half-Life 2. They're in control of the population now, and they've taken care of the Zen outbreak. Mostly. You'll still see a few barnacles, zombies, and headcrabs around, and even a few new variations that will challenge you on your journey. These poisonous headcrabs can be a little annoying, 
and to add insult to injury, there are even zombies with piles of poisonous headcrabs on top of them. Also, these fast zombies are a primary reason Ravenholm is such an intense level. But aside from that, yeah, you'd better get used to the Combine. And to be honest, I don't really mind that much. Half-Life 2 places you in many different combat scenarios that keep the act of killing Combine soldiers interesting. Nova Prospect is probably the best instance of this creativity. The place is really difficult to break into, and that's why a friendly Vortigaunt teaches you how to take control of the antlions with bug bait. This forces you to think differently, bobbing and weaving as you find an angle to throw the bug bait at Combine outposts. You'll even be doing this when you finally make it to the recess area of the prison, as you throw the bait at watchtowers and whatnot. The fun doesn't end there, though. Nova Prospect reintroduces the antlion guard from the chapter Sand Traps, only this time you have bigger weapons and a lot more debris to use against it. After that, you reunite with Alex and prepare for a Combine ambush. This tower defense motif was first introduced at the lighthouse in Highway 17, as you had to keep Combine forces and choppers away from the resistance. While dealing with striders and choppers may get repetitive toward the end of the game, the feeling of satisfaction when you finally take these behemoths down is euphoric. I also adore how they scripted the chopper here, as you're supposed to run up the stairs while avoiding the bullets the chopper is filling the lighthouse with. Nova Prospect zeroes in on this concept of tower defense, and considering the level is already claustrophobic enough, coming up with a game plan and adjusting it as soldiers flank from different directions is a hell of a lot of fun. There's no correct answer, all you have to do is survive. The game has prepared you for this. You've been fighting with Combine in all kinds of different scenarios, and you've learned how annoying yet fragile turrets can be. Now the game is allowing you to apply that knowledge in a unique scenario. This is why I love Nova Prospect as a whole, and these tower defense scenarios only continue into the chapter Follow Freeman. Like as you revisit the City 17 Plaza, you have to fend off a ton of Combine soldiers. Your supplies are limited and you have to make the most of them. It's really cool. I mean, I'll be real with you. All of these scenarios are why I love the combat in this game as a whole. It's simple shooter combat done really, really fucking well. Without you being conscious to it, the game trains you to face all of these different problems. They all blend together perfectly in a stream of intelligently designed combat scenarios and puzzles, just like the first game. Only this time, it's a sequel that trims the fat of the original and creates a world with as much depth as the player wants it to have. Outside of immersive sims, it's hard for me to come across games that do this so well. And that's why I love Half-Life 2. Even the climax of the game, while not quite meeting the grandiose scale of Zen, still reveals the true scope of Dr. Breen's negotiation. When infiltrating the Citadel, you discover what happens to citizens that are captured like Eli was. They're turned into stalkers, soulless husks of what were once just citizens attempting to resist. They mindlessly serve the Combine, and the concept of them possibly remembering who they once were is disturbing. I can forgive the roller coaster ride they put you through, as it gives you context for the final battle and a clear reason to hate Dr. Breen. Plus, the game hadn't had a tram ride sequence yet, so it works here. And what's more, they power up your gravity gun allowing you to blast through Combine soldiers and throw giant computer monitors and bouncy death orbs at them. Just wreck shit. It's a nice reward for everything you've been through, and the final frontier has you blowing up Breen's portal reactor, only for one of the best ending sequences in the history of anything ever to ensue. We've got to get out of here. Maybe we still have- Time, Dr. Freeman? Is it really that time again? It seems as if you only just arrived. You've done a great deal in a small time span. You've done so well, in fact, that I've received some interesting offers for your services. Ordinarily, I wouldn't contemplate them, but these are extraordinary times. Hmm? I don't really know how to conclude my evaluation of this game. Obviously, I do think Half-Life 2 is an incredible game, and a textbook example of how to make a video game, let alone a first-person shooter. But I know I'm not alone in feeling that way. You've heard the praise, you've most likely played the game, and you know why it's such a big deal. What can I say that hasn't already been said? You know, Perhaps I could say that the design of Half-Life 2 needs to remain in the public consciousness. Half-Life 2 isn't a game that should be forgotten. You can design a linear shooter with the same level of depth that comes from shooters with RPG or open world elements. You just have to take the leap. And that's why I believe Half-Life 2 stands the test of time. It took that leap to show the world that linear shooters didn't necessarily have to railroad you or limit your choice in progression. 
That's why it had such a massive influence on shooters, and that's why it still stands on its own two feet. At least, that's how I feel about it, and I'll be sure to revisit City 17 for years to come. Support for Half-Life 2 by an excited community has not ceased and will not cease. If you thought Half-Life 1 had a lot of mods, Half-Life 2 makes that pool of mods seem like a shallow pond. Valve once again released the SDK for their engine, ensuring that a waterfall of mods would be pouring onto the internet. Some of these mods were prominent enough to gain a standalone release, like Black Mesa, a full-on remake of Half-Life using the Source Engine's many features to create an entirely new experience. Gary's mod allows players to experiment more casually with the Source Engine's physics and get creative, kind of like Media Molecule's Little Big Planet. Its tools are relatively easy to understand. Thus, people poured thousands of hours into it, creating all sorts of wonderful things. It's also spawned its own multiplayer scene, with classic modes like Prop Hunt, Hide and Seek, and one of my personal favorites, You Touched It Last. A nice friendly game of Hot Potato where the ball explodes. There are so many mods to play and I encourage you to explore this field if you haven't already. There are so many awesome mods out there. The point is, the Source Engine is easy to develop for, and can handle whatever people decide to throw at it. Like I mentioned before, Titanfall 2 was developed in the Source Engine. Obviously it was heavily modified, but the fact that they were able to get anywhere with an engine that has been around for almost two decades is pretty impressive, and a testament to the engine's abilities. Of course, Half-Life 2 itself received support from Valve for a long while. Shortly after the release of Half-Life 2, a Deathmatch client would also be released. I didn't really discuss Half-Life Deathmatch, and that's because outside of the large amount of community support, I find it to be largely unremarkable. I like using weapons from the single player in a multiplayer setting, and Crossfire is one of the best maps in any Deathmatch FPS, but it's nothing I'd write home about. Half-Life 2 Deathmatch is pretty cool though. Using the gravity gun to get kills on other people that are also using the gravity gun is an adrenaline rush. I always have a lot of fun whenever I jump on Half-Life 2 Deathmatch. Even if its lack of support nowadays is a little disappointing. It was also largely overshadowed by Counter-Strike Source, which was bundled with most copies of Half-Life 2 upon release, and feels like a full-fledged game in its own right. So, you can see why it got left in the dust. But I do wish Half-Life 2 Deathmatch got the support it deserved, with all kinds of different modes and whatnot. The insanity that can ensue when playing Half-Life 2 Deathmatch makes it worth checking out. Valve also released an extra level for Half-Life 2 a year later, on October 27th, 2005 called Half-Life 2 Lost Coast. As you can probably guess, it was meant to take place during the Highway 17 chapters of Half-Life 2, and Valve instead used it as an outlet to demonstrate the Source Engine's HDR capabilities. You can get the full picture if you turn on developer commentary while you play through the level, a feature that Valve would subsequently include in most of their games released thereafter. Essentially it gives insight into various parts of the level's design and the tech behind HDR. One thing I found interesting is how they regretted not utilizing vertical level design more often. I remember that one instance outside of Black Mesa and another instance outside of Nova Prospect as the two most memorable uses of this kind of design. I do agree that they could have done more of this. It was a unique setting for dealing with enemies. Lost Coast is a nice burst of excitement that I can imagine only left fans hungry for more Half-Life. Indeed, Valve had a much bigger responsibility on their shoulders. They revolutionized the field twice, and despite the success of the Half-Life franchise, they were aware that people would be foaming at the mouth for more. Therefore, rather than taking a decade to attempt the same feat, they would feed their fans more content with the existing engine, narrative, and gameplay concepts. This could further develop the characters we've come to love and expand comfortably upon ideas presented in Half-Life 2. This approach led to the conception of Half-Life 2 Aftermath, which would eventually expand into an episodic approach to content delivery. Valve would assemble multiple teams that would leapfrog each other, in order for content to be delivered at a steady pace. Gabe Newell himself was convinced that this episodic model was the way of the future, even though he would doubt this model's future only a year later, and then he'd finally go back on his stance in 2011. But at the time, he was very excited. This would allow them to deliver a full sequel in short bursts. Once the trilogy was complete, we'd have the equivalent to a full game on our hands. What could go wrong? <laughs> right? Half-Life 2 Episode 1 released on June 1st, 2006, after several delays. Even the word frequent is subject to Valve time, apparently. But let's take a look at the first game in the Episodic Trilogy. Some people may view Episode 1 as a generally underwhelming addition to the franchise. Its drawn-out intro, lack of major innovation, short length, and god-awful ending sequence where you travel back and forth to escort rebels are seen as points of contention. And I understand those complaints. I agree that the intro has far too much watching and waiting for scripted sequences to end without any real interaction. And the game treats its first minutes as a potential intro to Half-Life. 
babying you into mechanics that should have already been second nature if you play shooters. Even if this was somehow a person's first Half-Life game, this isn't their first shooter. I find it highly unlikely they would need to learn how to traverse platforms and whatnot. The intro does pick up, however, once you re-enter the Citadel and work your way back down to City 17. Combat is entirely focused on utilizing the gravity gun, much like the climax of Half-Life 2. They even remind you of the importance of movement here, by having you dodge fast-moving orbs in a tight corridor. Puzzles require you to analyze situations thoroughly, even this early on. Throwing these orbs around may seem like a mindless task, but you'll also have to solve these orb puzzles while changing the trajectory of your launch and factoring in the bounce of the orb, all while dealing with Combine soldiers. So thankfully the game picks up the pace quickly. On the topic of innovation, Episode 1 does add a few notable things. Aside from a couple of cool new enemies like the Zombine that suicide bombs you, and methods of dealing with said enemies like plugging up antlion nests with cars, Alex now reacts more believably to your actions and she'll participate more actively in combat. This upgrade makes sense, as she sticks by your side throughout the entire game. It's nice that you can treat her as an equal in more cooperative situations by shining your flashlight on enemies in dark areas, for example. This lets Alex do the work and it saves you ammo. In some scenarios, she'll actually hold enemies down with her foot and execute them. It's a great extension of her abilities and overall presence in Half-Life 2. But aside from that, there aren't many other noteworthy changes to the game. The only new scenarios I remember visiting were a hospital and a parking garage, but the former was very similar in structure to other buildings you'd explore in Half-Life 2. So, yeah, I get it. To be fair, an episodic sequel that released a year and a half after Valve's biggest game yet wasn't going to be very over the top and impressive, and that contextualizes the game's 4-5 to five hour runtime. That's not to say those hours aren't packed with exciting gameplay, because they are. Episode 1 is still a great fucking game. It has the same clever use of the gravity gun and your own resourcefulness to solve puzzles, and really engaging combat scenarios like the dark parking garage that you have to survive in, and the final showdown with the Strider, where your cover won't last long and sometimes you'll have to make your own. It's got the same seamless design and implementation of ideas that you should come to expect. It's more Half-Life 2, and that's fine with me. Although, there is one unlockable achievement that brings Episode 1 up from being just a simple expansion of ideas already established. And that achievement is known as the One Free Bullet, in which you clear the game by only firing a single bullet from your pistol, that bullet being used to break the lock on a gate in the parking garage. You can only use your gravity gun, crowbar, rocket launcher, and grenades to finish the game. This will force you to completely rethink your methods of dealing with enemies. You'll have to use anything you can find as a weapon. If you think it might pack a punch, it'll have to do. Remember why I loved Ravenholm? This achievement can really make Episode 1 feel like you turned that level into a full game. The physics engine was always an active part of Half-Life 2's design, as I said before, whether you were aware of its integration or not. However, using what you could find as a potential solution to a problem is all up to the player to discover, and this is a great way to put that philosophy to the test, and I recommend everyone give it a try. It's a great challenge and a lot of fun. This also gives context to Alex's revamped AI programming as you'll need a reliable partner when you're not using ammo. Remember that scenario when you're shining your flashlight on enemies for Alex to shoot? It allows you to make it through without firing a bullet. It's little things like these that make me appreciate the design of Episode 1 more and more as time goes on. It certainly doesn't save that escort section though, it only makes it worse. It is really that bad. I've danced around this topic already, but before you can have your final showdown with a Strider and Escape City 17, you gotta make sure a group of rebels make it to their train. This requires trekking back and forth over and over again, dodging an onslaught of Combine while simultaneously attempting to keep a certain number of Rebels alive. It gets repetitive very quickly, and while we have come a long way since the pitiful escorting of Half-Life 1, the reason this is so grueling is because it goes on for so long. It's an efficient way to completely destroy the game's phenomenal pacing up to this point. But yeah, the game ends on a positive note. Episode 1's gravity gun driven design and new additions make playing through it a great time, and while I don't revisit it nearly as much as I'd like to, I'll still remember my time with it fondly. And that's what it all should come back to. Following the release of Episode 1, development on the other two episodic installments continued. The overlapping technique seemed to be working in Valve's favor, and even more episodes were on track to be released after Episode 3 launched. Arcane Studios signed on to develop an episode called Return to Ravenholm, and Warren Spector's studio Junction Point were also taking on their own episode. Things were moving along nicely, and Half-Life wasn't going anywhere. On top of all this, Valve dropped a bombshell during EA's summer presentation in 2007. Half-Life 2 Episode 2, the elusive vaporware Team Fortress 2, and the incredibly unique and impressive physics-based puzzle game Portal were all going to be bundled together in a package called The Orange Box. This package, overall, 
is a testament to Valve's incredible commitment to creating games. And it seems like no matter what they decided to tackle, they would come out on top. The orange box represents Valve's monumental influence on the industry, and will forever encapsulate the sheer amount of passion that was present in those offices. As much as I'd like to talk about Portal and Team Fortress 2 in addition to Episode 2, that's not what this video is about. Maybe someday, but not today. Alongside those two games, Half-Life 2 Episode 2 released on October 10th, 2007, and it's a very strong contender for my favorite game in the entire series. Remember how I said Opposing Force was concise? Episode 2 is the same way, and while it doesn't bring much new to the table in weapon or enemy variety, it does however create a heavy focus on open-ended combat. If you recall, I love tower defense scenarios and situations where you need to traverse a massive area and kill enemies in order to progress. I love levels like Nova Prospect and chapters like Follow Freeman for these reasons. Episode 2 is all about that, from the intense encounter with the antlions while the Vortigaunts heal Alex's injuries, to the houses that get bombarded by Combine forces. Episode 2's heavy focus on combat is what makes it a consistently engaging game. I also love the last two showdowns that take place in the rocket silo and, well, all over White Forest. They cram the toughest enemies they can into the rocket silo, making it a truly claustrophobic experience. It's like if the halls of Black Mesa were just filled with enemies. And then they open combat up to the aforementioned White Forest battle, and it's a lot of fun. You need to drive around preventing the Striders from making it to the base by taking them down with the Magnuson device. While they will take down Striders upon detonation, the hunters surrounding them will make sure they shoot down the device before you can blow it up. Hunters are the one big bad that Valve added for Episode 2, and they are threatening enemies. They'll shoot darts that explode after a while, and if you get some stuck to you, be prepared to take some heavy damage. They take quite a few hits to kill, but they aren't going to drive you insane. The best strategy in this situation is to drive straight into them, which is fast but isn't easy, and can leave you open to their attacks. But when you do drive straight into them, it's a wonderful feeling. I also love dealing with the big mama antlion in this cave here. There's not much you can really do to slow it down, so whenever you manage to distract it, you only have a limited amount of time to scurry towards the nearest tunnel. It's a pretty scary experience. Most of these encounters are also heightened by Kelly Bailey's soundtrack. Both episodes 1 and 2 featured interesting use of guitars, as the distortion simulated the sounds of a strider. Episode 2 features some of the best music Half-Life has seen for sure. It kicks ass. That's not to say the heavy focus on combat means Episode 2 doesn't feature the hallmarks of previous Half-Life games, because it definitely does. It wouldn't be a Half-Life game if it didn't seamlessly blend elements together. Physics-based and exploration-based puzzles are still alive and kicking, and while they aren't going to change the game here, they still contribute to the overall design Half-Life has established for itself. It's also quite nice to be visiting somewhere other than City 17 for once. White Forest feels like it should have been peaceful, and that's why it's so disheartening seeing how the Combine have affected it. The atmosphere it emanates definitely has range in that regard. One gameplay element that I am not particularly a big fan of is the game's idea of an alternative challenge. Remember the one free bullet? Episode 2's version of that is bringing a garden gnome prop all the way to the rocket and throwing him inside. It's a good way to demonstrate how the Source Engine can remember where objects are placed in the world, but actually doing this can be a repetitive nightmare, especially when you have to travel by car. The little cunt just won't stay put, and he'll roll out of the car if you move even just a teeny tiny bit too fast. You could launch him ahead and then catch up with him, but that isn't much fun either. It's too bad that this achievement doesn't teach you much about the game's design. It was a neat way to demonstrate a feature of the Source engine, but it totally backfired in practice. Conversely, what this game does really well is narrative presentation. Episode 2 sets up many plot elements that are nothing short of intriguing. Although it does have a slow start, as soon as the G-Man intervenes, things start to get interesting. He has never done this before. He usually just likes to watch and wait as the events unfold. And as we're closing the book on an adventure and starting a new one, he'll fill us in. After all, that's what his employers want. Just let Gordon take care of the event set in motion. It's his job, right? That's why the Vortigaunts reaching out and saving Gordon was such a big deal in Episode 1. Any interference could potentially ruin whatever his plans may be. Thus, G-Man throws you a curveball. 
he actually needs you to take care of Alex this time more than anything, implying that she may be of some use. He also tells Alex to relay some rather unsettling words, and I think you know what those are. When you see your father relay these words, prepare for unforeseen consequences. At first, it's obviously not clear what he means, but as they slip out upon meeting up with the Resistance, Eli immediately knows what to do. He knows it must have something to do with the Borealis. The Borealis is a fabled ship rumored to have been used by Aperture Science for something. It's not known what, but earlier Dr. Kleiner relays what he thinks it might have been used for. Our peers at Aperture Science were at work on a project of some promise. But in their rush to beat Black Mesa for funding, they must have compromised ordinary standards of risk. We heard their research vessel had simply disappeared, vanished, with all hands, and even part of the dry dock. Of course, a debate ensued. We don't really have context for any of this at first, other than the Combine possibly wanting to harness its power, but once Eli reminds us of the words of our mutual friend, things become a little clearer. Or do they? See. As Gordon and Alex are about to leave for the Arctic to research the Borealis, the unthinkable happens. A Combine advisor bursts into the hangar and picks Eli up, restraining him, and since it was demonstrated previously what Combine advisors could do to people, both us and Eli know there isn't much time left. With the death of Eli, the true meaning of the G-Man's warning becomes clear. Yes, he may have been warning us about the Borealis, but he was also warning us about the death of Eli, and how that would affect everyone around him. And watching him lifelessly dangle above the ground as a result of the G-Man's meddling still hurts my heart to this day. And now we have to wonder how Alex is going to deal with this. I love Episode 2 as a whole for its evolution in combat and level design, but what makes it stand out to me is the number of exciting plot elements it sets up. This would prove to be the mother of all cliffhangers in video games. Eli is dead, and as you and Alex are about to race towards the Borealis and beat the Combine to the punch, many other Resistance members believe the Borealis should be preserved in research, rather than destroyed. The story could go in so many different directions, and with a mystery as large as the Borealis itself, I was drowning in my own endless anticipation for the final chapter. Eli, there's not a next one. They didn't make a next one. And they were saying they're not gonna make another one. So we'll never know what happened. Does that make you sad? I'm sorry, Eli. After Orange Box, we have to get episode three out. We know how the trilogy ends, and there are a bunch of loose ends and, and narrative arcs that need to come to a conclusion in episode three. The main thing that we're uh, working on right now after we get the Orange Box out the door is gonna be episode three. Our plan for Half-Life is to get through these three episodes. We are at the midpoint in our trilogy of episodes, which will conclude in episode three. Uh, we're not, I'm not saying anything about, about episode three. I really don't have anything to say about episode three right now. I got nothing to say about Half-Life. We don't have anything about Half-Life or episode three. The next 10 years would be riddled with consistent anxiety. Ever since the release of The Orange Box in 2007, Gabe Newell went from insisting they'd finish the story to saying absolutely nothing at all. No cancellation, no hope for the future. Virtually nothing from Valve themselves. 
They say this is because they only want to talk when they can be crisp on things, in order to avoid past mistakes that resulted in delays and broken promises. This would have been a respectable approach if the silence didn't last 12 fucking years. I've cherished the brief period of time where they released concept art for episode 3 and openly discussed concepts they wanted to explore. We didn't have a release window to consider, but it at least fueled my imagination and my excitement for Gordon Freeman's continuing adventures. But let's analyze this whole situation. Let's look at where things went wrong and consider everything that occurred since the release of the Orange Box in 2007. In the wake of that collection's warm reception, Gabe was adamant that the company's primary focus would be Half-Life 2 Episode 3, in order to finally finish the story. Gabe mentioned exploring the series' psychological horror roots, and Doug Lombardi discussed doing something pretty ambitious with Episode 3, possibly due to the emotional weight of the story they had to conclude. They needed to go all out with this one, but this would result in Episode 3 evolving into something more, and thus it was taking a lot longer to develop. Doug Lombardi even reaffirmed this stance back then, stating that the wait between Episode 3 and Episode 2 would be longer than the distance between Half-Life 2 and Episode 2. In 2008, the last piece of concept art was released by Valve, and that's all we've seen from them in regards to Episode 3. After the turn of the decade, Valve poured their focus into Portal 2, while suddenly growing silent on the future of the Half-Life series. Both Doug Lombardi and Gabe Newell refused to comment on the future of the series and would simply say something along the lines of, we have nothing to share at this time. It was around this time that leaked strings related to Episode 3 were being found all over different Valve games, particularly Alien Swarm and Portal 2's SDK. Speaking of Portal 2, that game's release brought with it a couple of very frightening prospects. Jeff Keighley speculated that it would be Valve's last single-player game. Although Gabe Newell disputed this, stating that he wanted social aspects of multiplayer games to be integrated into single-player games, Portal 2 has remained the last single-player game they've made, so this would become more troubling to think about as the years went by. In addition to that, remember the episodic model announcement I touched upon earlier? Yeah, now you have context for that. So, Episode 3 has been cancelled, right? Well, it'd be easier to believe that if the leaks didn't continue. It seemed like development was proceeding on to a fully-fledged sequel to Half-Life 2, with Valve's mailing list leaking in 2013, and a certain TXT file leaking in 2015 and revealing potential gameplay elements for this fabled sequel. While these leaks were tantalizing, it was far from being actual communication. The lead writer of the Half-Life series, Mark Laidlaw, would also confirm that Arkane's return to Ravenholm was cancelled in 2009 with Junction Point's episode following suit. I would have loved to see Ravenholm again, and learning about that magnet gun that Junction Point's episode was going to use got me really excited for the possibilities with puzzles and combat. Obviously, Valve didn't care enough to pursue these episodes any further, and both Arcane and Junction Point moved on to different things. Jeff Keighley reflected on something in Noclip's Half-Life documentary that would confirm to me that Valve's priorities lie elsewhere. When Half-Life 2 won Game of the Decade at the Spike Video Game Awards, Jeff mentioned wanting to tease something with our friend the G-Man at the very end. He asked Valve if they could do this, secretly hoping that they had a super high-res model raring to go for an incredible teaser. I'm sure he's paraphrasing, but here's what Jeff said their response was. I was like, I kind of asked Valve, I'm like, hey, you know, could we get like the G-Man model? And I was hoping they're like, oh yeah, we got this new G-Man model we're going to send down to you. And it's like, they're like, no, nah, we got to like go and find it. We don't know where it is. And it's like somewhere. And it's like, it's just not like, there wasn't actively like, oh yeah, we've been working on this super high res G-Man we're going to use for it. It's just, it wasn't even sort of part of the conversation. Yeah, not a lot of hope, huh? A lot of creative people that used to work at Valve have since left the company. Mark Laidlaw, Chet Falasek, Doug Wood, Kelly Bailey, Victor Antonov, they've all left and worked on other projects. Even the writers for the episodic Half-Life games and Portal, Jay Pinkerton and Eric Woolpaw, exited the company for a brief period of time. I feel like this was due to Valve not releasing a new game in-house since Portal 2. When creative people aren't allowed to flex their creative muscles, of course they'll want to move on. This, coupled with a lack of communication, made it very clear to me that Valve just didn't give a shit about their games anymore. They were making a fuckload of money, why should they have to expend the effort to make a video game anymore? And then when they finally announced a new game in 2017, it was Artifact. At this point, I had grown numb. Valve wasn't even on my mind by the time they announced this blatant attempt at cashing in on a trend. Half-Life had become a distant memory, and I believe that's been Valve's goal this whole time. Just keep silent and people will stop asking, right? As I was wrapped up in other games and enjoying the rest of my 2017 summer break, Mark Laidlaw, 
out of nowhere, posted something on his blog that would give the world exactly what they wanted. Closure. In a letter titled Epistol 3, Mark writes about the adventures of characters that sound similar in nature to some familiar faces from about a decade ago. Gertie Fremont? Ellie Vaunt? And what's this Hyperborea they keep talking about? Yeah, it didn't take very long for this to be interpreted as the hypothetical plot for Episode 3. Allow me to go over the translated plot provided by Jackathan, where names and pronouns are as they should be, and discuss it overall. Normally, I'm against putting plot summaries in videos like these, but this is kind of all we have to work with, isn't it? In Episode 3, Gordon and Alex were supposed to travel to the Arctic in search of the Borealis, as predicted. After her father's death, Alex had to find the courage to carry out the rest of the mission, and this dedication inspired the Resistance to follow suit. Eli's death would be a prevailing dominant theme when motivating character decisions, it seems, and the atmosphere would have been fairly grim. You'll soon understand what I mean by all this. Alex and Gordon head for the Borealis in that helicopter we saw at the end of Episode 2, only for it to be taken down by... something. Gordon and Alex meander their way through the snow and ice after that incident, eventually stumbling upon a combine base where Judith's coordinates said the Borealis would be. As it turns out, it was only one of many locations where the Borealis was going to be, as it was phasing in and out of reality just as Dr. Kleiner foreshadowed in Episode 2, and Combine forces were studying the Borealis in hopes of harnessing its power. Some Resistance members also wanted to study the Borealis as we know, but the knowledge the Borealis carries with it could prove to be overwhelmingly dangerous. Plus, we gotta remember what G-Man said. Before they could get any further, however, Gordon and Alex were captured. Not by Combine soldiers, but by minions of Dr. Breen. If you recall, Breen's fate at the end of Half-Life 2 was left ambiguous. Presumably he died, but it's not like we knew what would have happened if a portal reactor were to erupt with a person still inside of it. Now instead of exploring that, Mark decided to say that his consciousness was preserved by the Combine so they could use it later. Sure, why not? What is more impactful, however, is Breen's presence in this scene. His consciousness was uploaded to a massive version of those slugs from Episode 2. This idea is something Mark Laidlaw teased on Twitter from 2012 to 2014, and seeing it come to fruition would have been really unsettling. Dr. Breen confesses to Gordon and Alex that the Combine would not let him go, and he asks them to end his miserable existence as a grotesque monstrosity. Alex would rather let him suffer in life, but the player ultimately would have had the choice to either kill or spare Dr. Breen while out of sight of Alex. I say this might have been the case because of Mark's careful wording. Alex believed that a quick death was more than Wallace Breen deserved. But for my part, I felt a modicum of pity and compassion. Out of Alex's sight, I might have done something to hasten the slug's demise before we proceeded. This can also, grammatically speaking, imply that Gordon killed Breen. But based on the concept for Gordon as a character, a vessel for the player to embody, it feels odd that Gordon would imply something or explain how he feels about a situation in his writing, rather than outright say it. Keep this in mind. If he's outright saying something, it means that it was meant to occur. If he's being intentionally vague or expressing subjective emotion about a situation, I believe a modicum of choice or personal debate would be the result in the final game. And I'm pointing this out for a bigger reason, too. You'll understand soon enough. Anyway, as Gordon and Alex proceeded, they found Judith in a Combine interrogation cell. Alex and Judith have always had a certain level of a... animosity towards one another. And with Eli's death still weighing heavily on her, it's no wonder she would explode on Judith. I imagine Alex would have blamed Judith's delivery of the Borealis' information to Eli as the cause of his death. Judith reiterated her previous point that she served as a double agent in the best interest of the Resistance, and that she deeply cared about Eli and Alex and everyone else. And although Alex still didn't believe her, Judith was essential in bringing the Borealis into existence so that they could all board it. Once it was docked, the three of them rushed towards the ship, with Combine in hot pursuit. Aboard the Borealis, Gordon, Alex, and Judith all scattered in order to seek control of the ship, and in doing so, they learned about its history. They discovered the bootstrap device, assembled by researchers at Aperture Science, in order to create a self-contained method of teleportation. No entry or exit portals, just instantaneous transmission. This is how the ship was able to blink in and out of reality on its own. However, as the Seven Hour War ensued, Aperture Science staff used the bootstrap device to teleport it away from Combine forces. However, since the device lacked proper testing, they didn't realize that it also teleported through time in addition to space. This is how it ended up in the present day Arctic, and soon after the team had come to that realization, they noticed they could see Aperture Science at the moment Combine forces closed in, at the same time as the Resistance were fighting off the Combine in the Arctic in the present day. Alex felt that this was a central staging area for the Combine to invade other worlds. While they fought to keep Combine forces off the ship, 
they were also seeing a plethora of different moments in time, seeing different versions of themselves from past instances on the ship. It seemed absolutely maddening, and I would have loved to experience this in the interactive medium. And as a time travel device, the Borealis works really well. It avoids a massive time paradox because if time travel were to be properly utilized, the entire canon would be destroyed because Combine could just easily undo the existence of humanity if they wanted to. I mean, G-Man can presumably travel through time, but come on. I'd like you to tell me what exactly the G-Man is doing throughout Half-Life. But yeah, kudos to Mark Laidlaw for not fucking up with time travel. It's really hard to get it right. On the topic of utilizing time travel, that's just it. There is no way they could have done this without risking the destruction of time flow. Therefore, it seemed like the only outcome in this situation would be the destruction of the Borealis, just as Eli wanted. However, Judith's commitment to research overpowered Alex, and she prepared to shut down the bootstrap device. It really seemed like the game would have taken this route and dealt with the impending risk of paradox if the Combine were to seize the Borealis. However, just as that thought is beginning to materialize, Alex shoots and kills Judith. I imagine her devotion to fulfilling her father's dying wish, and her hatred for Judith's actions up to this point, finally pushed her to take drastic measures. Before you can process Judith's death, the story moves on. It seems that drastic measures would be the only course of action from here on out. Alex steered the Borealis towards the Combine's Dyson Sphere, aiming to deal a fatal blow to their power supply once and for all. But then, as Gordon and Alex were headed for certain doom, in the name of the Combine's destruction, the G-Man appeared before them. Instead of placing Gordon in stasis like he usually does in situations like these, he plucked Alex from the Borealis instead, presumably because she made the decisions that would lead to the Combine's destruction, which is really fucking interesting. However, as the G-Man exited and the Combine's Dyson Sphere came into view, Gordon, or rather you, were to realize that the Borealis would barely even leave a mark on the Combine's power supply. However, the Vortigaunts come to your rescue, just as they did in Episode 1. As the Borealis explodes upon impact with the Dyson Sphere, you are placed elsewhere. Presumably somewhere far, far away on a remote shore. The G-Man has left you behind, and all that remains are memories. While Gordon and Alex did preserve the flow of time by destroying the Borealis, and they granted Eli's dying wish, the Combine might have persisted. And the fate of the Resistance is left up in the air. Anything could happen at this point. And that's all she wrote. Episode 3 was an incredibly ambitious finale, no doubt about that. I'm willing to bet Valve at least tried to get this game off the ground, but the scope of the project and their shifting priorities led to Half-Life being left in the dust without a conclusion. But now, we have that conclusion. Not in the form of a game, mind you, but we have closure. The letter's closing paragraph has a double meaning. It both represents what might have been running through the players' heads in Episode 3, and also marks final thoughts on the matter. I spoke of my return to the shore. It has been a circuitous path to lands I once knew and surprising to see how much the terrain has changed. Enough time has passed that few remember me or what I was saying when I last spoke, or what precisely we hope to accomplish. At this point, the Resistance will have failed or succeeded, no thanks to me. Old friends have been silenced and fallen by the wayside. I no longer know or recognize most members of the research team. Though, I believe the spirit of rebellion still persists. I expect you know better than I the appropriate course of action, and I leave you to it. Expect no further correspondence from me regarding these matters. This is my final episode. Yours in infinite finality, Gordon Freeman, PhD. While it is a beautiful conclusion to a decade-long wait, it is also Mark's call to action. Mark can't give the world a Half-Life game. It's up to us to pick up the pieces and create something out of what he's left for us. And with games like Project Borealis and Boreal Aleph on the horizon, as well as the incredible Epistle 3 game jam, it's clear to me that the spirit of rebellion does still persist. It's 2019. Valve is releasing their new virtual reality headset in June, known as the Valve Index. Features that have been detailed include feeling the audio playing through the headset, and a module on the front that allows for expansions. The controllers have insanely accurate finger tracking technology, but despite these major innovations, the problem with Valve releasing a headset is the fact that they cannot be competitive at this point without bundling the headset with software. Let's think about this. Valve must have spent a lot of time and money working on this headset. So in order to make that money back, they need to charge a reasonable price. That's why the headset, bundled with its controllers and base stations, costs $1,000. But because it costs that much, a lot of average consumers will be turned off. They won't be motivated to fork over a grand for these new features especially if they're not being utilized effectively. Hypothetically, 
They could have sold the headset at a low price and relied on Steam to rake in the cash they need, but guess what? Epic Games is stealing their business now. So the ball is in Valve's court. No matter which way you look at it, they need something else to drive sales. Valve needs a game to push the features of their headset. And that game could potentially break VR into the mainstream and hopefully make the medium a mainstay in households nationwide. Aside from Canada, by the way. Virtual reality needs that push right now. From what I can tell, it's only seen as a novelty to most outside consumers these days. And Valve has thought about this. In an interview with Tyler McVicker of Valve News Network, Gabe Newell said that he was jealous of Miyamoto because he was able to design games in conjunction with hardware. And with this headset on the way, he was most likely hinting at future software being developed to accompany the headset's features and legitimize the product in the eyes of consumers. Supposedly, Valve has three full VR games in development. Yes, you heard me correctly. Not only are they making video games again, but they're making three video games simultaneously. That elusive number. But obviously, as they are VR games, they won't be traditional sequels to any of the games we know and love. But they just might be related in spirit. Of the three VR games, we know what at least one of them is thanks to leaks that date back to June of 2015. That game was initially leaked in an update for the Steam VR app Destinations, and it was being referred to as... HLVR. Strings found in subsequent updates implied that progress was being made on the project. And not only does it feature the return of Zen, but it also has at least one segment that requires the player to speak. The more I think about this project, the more I think it could actually convince new players to finally bring virtual reality into their lives. But that would mean completely blowing everyone away. That would mean making the best VR game to date and revolutionizing the medium. Valve hasn't pulled something like that off in a very long time. A lot of their creative people have since moved on to other ventures. Regardless of whether or not this mythical Half-Life VR game releases, I just want to say one thing. Remember when I mentioned that the world hasn't forgot? Well, I wasn't just referring to the impact the series has left. I was also referring to the 12 years of silence we've been put through. The lack of communication Valve has displayed is, frankly, saddening. From their perspective, they've decided keeping us in the dark about the twists and turns they're facing is for the best. But in doing so, they've left fans to their own devices. They've been forced to be stringed along by frustratingly dubious leaks and rumors. When it gets to the point where so many creative people are leaving the company, it feels like it's too late for them to make a game again. Of all the creative people that have left, Mark Laidlaw implied his frustration with not being able to finish the episodic trilogy at the very least. I mean, that's why we have Epistle 3. These people want to move on, they want to be creative, they want to make art. But despite the silence or the prospect of a VR game coming out, I think what's most important is the passion fans have shown for the lack of a proper continuation to the Half-Life series. It speaks volumes to how important art is to our everyday lives. Because of Half-Life, some of us have decided to develop our own games. Some of us have started writing our own stories. We've created our own art because we were inspired and it makes us happy. Or if that's not the case, it's a well-deserved method of escapism. Something that can help us forget about our problems in everyday lives, if only for just a few hours at a time. We can immerse ourselves in another world before returning to reality. That's why I think people are so frustrated about the lack of proper closure. At the heart of it all, we need these experiences. And you know what? Gabe Newell has echoed these feelings and he understands where we're coming from. You know, I, I get it. I mean, I'm, uh, I'm a fan of TV shows. I'm a fan of writers. I'm a fan of movies. I'm a fan of games. And I, I certainly understand why people are like, you know, hey, th I remember the, this awesome experience and I'm starting to get worried that I'm never going to get to have it uh, again. He also discussed the possible future for Valve franchises. Aside from explaining that they want to use the right tool at the right time, he also said this. The only reason we'd go back and do like a super classic kind of product is if a whole bunch of people just internally at Valve said, you know, they wanted to do it, you know, and, and had a, a reasonable explanation for why it was. But, you know, if you want to do another Half-Life game and you want to ignore everything we've learned, you know, in shipping, you know, Portal 2 and in shipping, you know, all the updates on the multiplayer side, you know, that, that seems like a, a bad choice. So we'll, t we'll keep moving forward, but that doesn't necessarily always mean what people are worried that it might mean. I get it. They want to move on and they want to learn from their mistakes. But based on the decisions with Artifact and the lack of communication regarding future software and Team Fortress 2 updates, it seems like they're still struggling in some regard. So, no Valve. No matter what you may or may not announce in the future, even if it is Half-Life related, we won't forget. We won't forget the decade of silence. 
We won't forget the hole you've left in our hearts, no matter how you try to make things up to us. You might think it's mature to stay silent until you can confirm what's going on, but when you leave so many people in the dark for this long when you've promised something, it's hard for your consumers to stay loyal. I won't be boycotting you. I just wish I could look at you the same way I did all those years ago. In all my years of playing video games, very few series have been as essential to me as Half-Life. From what it brought to game design and interactive storytelling as a whole, I firmly believe it deserves to be held in high esteem. And yet, it's not even my favorite series from Valve. Portal is. Even so, I was still passionate enough to make this monstrous analysis of the Half-Life series. That's how much I care about Half-Life, and how much I once cared about Valve. I want this to serve as a testament to the series' impact and legacy. Some of you may have heard about all this a million times before, but if I was willing to go out of my way to explain why the series is so important to me, and why I think it deserves to be remembered, I'm sure there are others that feel the same way. I may have been harsh on Valve as a company, but that's only because I love their games. Art is something that many people turn to as a form of escapism, and for one of their biggest inspirations in life to suddenly fall off the face of the earth for a decade, yeah, it's gonna be disheartening. That's why there have been so many undying pleas for a return. Because we love art. And if art didn't have consumers, moreover, if you didn't have consumers, Valve, where would you be? That's why Half-Life deserves to be talked about. That's why art deserves to be discussed. Because it's such an important part of our lives, and it can shape us as people. I mean, I'm sure I wouldn't be the same person I am today if I didn't have art and entertainment in my life. If I wasn't learning lessons from the things I watched and the games I played. And I know I'm not alone on that. All in all, Half-Life did wonders for the industry and it still stands the test of time. And it will stand the test of time for years to come. Do you agree or disagree with things I said in this video? Well, now it's your turn to talk. Let me know how Half-Life has affected you in the comments below, because I love discussing art. That's why I'm here, and that's why I'll continue to be here. I'm here because I love to share my experiences. They've helped me grow as a person, and I want to explain why and how. Well, with all that said, I've been Liam Triforce, and I'd like to thank you for watching. Holy shit! I didn't say Half-Life 3 once in this video! <laughs> How did I do that? <laughs>